Those clothes actually included a satanic logo. Target is a perfect illustration of the slippery slope which is moral decline. Such corporate policies accelerate depravity and endanger our wives and daughters who use Target restrooms or changing areas. Learn more and sign the Target Boycott Pledge at AFA.net. Jenna Ellis in the morning on American Family Radio. I love talking about the things of God because of truth and the biblical worldview. The U.S. Constitution obligates our government to preserve and protect the rights that our founders recognize come from God our Creator, not our government. I believe that Scripture in the Bible is very clear that God is the one that raised up each of you and God has allowed us to be brought here to this specific moment in time. This is Jenna Ellis in the morning. Good morning. It is April Fool's Day, April 1st. So uh, really, this should be the Trans Day of Visibility on on April 1st. Uh, But no, that was uh, celebrated yesterday by Joe Biden's White House. But we'll get to that more because uh, in in the next segment, because um, first we need to acknowledge Easter Sunday yesterday. And we need to do that over and above anything crazy and stupid that the left does. uh, Because if you let them steal your joy and the joy that was um, the amazing celebration of the finished work of the gospel, then um, we are living more for the world than we are for Christ. And of course, you know, things can and should rightly upset us, but not over and above the joy that we have in him. And I hope that everyone had a wonderful Easter Sunday celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And um, I, I went to the sunrise service at my church yesterday, and it was beautiful because in Florida, it was warm enough to do this. So, so in Colorado, I, th- there are a, a few places that have sunrise services, but very few because it is always absolutely freezing and you have to you know, wear a parka and, and ski gear basically. And sometimes it's a blizzard on Easter Sunday. <laughs> and so um, this was my first uh, Easter as a resident of Florida. And it was just beautiful and amazing uh, to be out there in the darkness and then seeing uh, the sun rise and worshiping our Lord and Savior together with um, many believers. And um, and it was really cool because my church did this um, overlooking a big lake. And there were actually, um, I think, like nine or ten boats that, that ended up coming out on the water and listening to the service as well from the boats. And so uh, they pointed some speed speakers and stuff over there uh, toward the lake so that the people who were watching on on the boat could uh, enjoy the service as well which which was pretty cool and um and, and it was and it was beautiful but going back to good friday um that service as well was very powerful and impactful. I hope that you go to a church that has a Good Friday service as well and continues to celebrate not just the finished work of Easter morning but the the suffering of Christ and why Good Friday we also celebrate, why it's good for us. Um, it was a terrible Friday, but without Good Friday, we would not have Easter morning and we would not have um, the hope of the gospel and the fulfillment of the promises of God. And Good Friday uh, last week, for those of you who are regular listeners and um, listen to that episode on Friday, uh, Walker Wildman was on with me and we were talking about Good Friday. And then we were also talking about living Christianly and living uh, with the hope that we have in Christ. And um, and then I, I, I from that, I also went and talked uh, about church discipline and this whole idea of accountability in a local church and why uh, the Bible requires us. It's not a suggestion. It is a requirement to be a member of a local church, not just so that you can have activities and you can have a place to go and you can have community. That's what a lot of mega churches will sell you right now. It's it's a lot more a marketing and business technique than it is actually being the church. But we need to be part of a local church that is the church. And what does that mean? Well, being the church um, means that we take seriously um, that we are under church authority. And um, and so I talked a lot, and if you missed that episode, you can always go back at AFR.net, listen to any of the podcasts of, of this show um, that, that currently um, is live, and then, of course, people will be listening to this later as well. Um, but church discipline is important, not just because of um, the accountability part, but because of um, the 
admonishment that we are supposed to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And if we are truly growing in the knowledge of the Lord, then we will continue to act Christianly. We will conform our behavior in our daily lives, in our workplaces, everywhere uh, that we that we are as Christians, and we will conform our lives to what Christ requires. And the church is supposed to help that. And it's not a matter of church discipline as, you know, some children think of their parents as, as being harsh. And, and for the parents that are listening, you know that you discipline your children because you love them, because you want to train them up in the way that they should go, because you want them to learn how to live rightly. You want to teach them the good lessons. You want them to choose on their own what is right, what is, um, healthy, what is good. And in the same way, that is the attitude of church discipline is hopefully with that accountability, there is repentance and then restoration. It hopefully should not ever get to the point in the life of a genuine Christian that the full extent of Matthew 18 has to be exercised. Hopefully, Uh, When your brothers and sisters in Christ and especially church leadership uh, come to you, if there is if there is an issue that reaches the level of church discipline, then you hear that and you repent of your sin and you conform uh, to Christ. And, And that is a very good thing. And. Um, and I raised this topic because after a uh, Friday show, um, I actually got probably the most feedback that I've gotten on an episode um, of this show in a while. And, and a lot of you were very thankful for discussing this. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, then there was actually no, no negative feedback. Occasionally we get those and they're not as, as positive as, as, and encouraging as, as Tim always asks for. Um, but all of this was, and I heard from a lot of you that have um, had similar experiences um, in your church of, of seeing them exercise church discipline or why you go uh, to your church. But um, but all of that to say, when um, when we talked about that Friday morning on the show, then I went Friday evening to the Good Friday service. And, um, and, and the way that my church did this was um, actually really powerful. And I felt very, um, very solid in terms of going chronologically from the beginning in the Garden of Eden when Adam was faced with the choice, uh, do, do I obey the Lord or not? And of course he chose not to and sin entered the world and, and original sin and we were then fallen and, and creation is cursed and we know that we um, need a savior and from that moment the shedding of blood was necessary in order to um, to follow the requirements of the Lord and pay the punishment of our sin. And then ultimately the sacrifice of the perfect man, the son of God, um, Christ, God himself was needed. And, and then, and so we went chronologically kind of through this and then from the first garden, then to the garden of Gethsemane, which is, um, you know, in, uh, in the gospels and um, those four different perspectives from um, that tell the same historical truth of what happened. It's not just a story, but the truth of what happened. And in the garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was faced with that same decision, um, because that was the moment of betrayal and that was the moment that he was going to be turned over for a sham trial and and ultimately then um, be killed. And in that moment, he had the uh, the decision, does he obey God or not? And thankfully, um, what happened in the first garden did not happen in the second garden, and God chose to obey. And um, and and the pastor that was teaching this portion of um, of the of the service, and we had a number of the teaching pastors that actually participated and sang hymns, and and it was really beautiful. But um, he 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 made a comment that really um, I thought about for a while on Good Friday, which was talking about the cup of perdition and how uh, when when Jesus was so agitated and literally was sweating um, drops of blood in the garden. He said, you know, what What was the reason that caused Jesus so much um, just gut-wrenching um, agony? And, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't fear of death. Um, he knew the story. He knew the promises. He knew what he was there for to fulfill and that he would overcome death. It wasn't fear of death. It wasn't fear of suffering that had been prophesied and foretold in, you know, Isaiah and all of the Old Testament 
prophetic witness that um, that Jesus would come. And so what was it that that Jesus was so in agony about. And, um, and, and the scripture says that because he was facing the cup and that was his prayer, if this cup passes from me, uh, but, and then he submitted and was obedient to the Lord. He said, not my will, but yours be done. And it was facing all of the sin and all of the shame and all of the absolute wickedness of our sin that, for generations and as long as human history has lived and will live until uh, the second coming in Christ's return and, and we are caught up with him and there is a new heaven and new earth, um, the sin that, as the Apostle Saul says, uh, Paul says, so easily besets us. And that stench of that cup was so disgusting and, and put him in such agony facing that because that was the only moment of separation when God the Father turned his back and was separated when Christ was on the cross. And that really was a moment of um, resonance for for me sitting in that in that service, thinking about that and picturing that um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's the reason for church discipline, because we should not even have to go through that kind of accountability to have a church go all the way through the Matthew 18 process and not repent of our sin. Because if we have a clear picture of what our sin, how vile and gross and terrible and disgusting our sin is as an affront to God himself, then we won't want to do any of that. We will want to enjoy and in love for the Lord, be obedient to what he calls us to. We don't want to participate in that sin anymore. It's not, yes, are we tempted and we, we fall and we make mistakes and we choose to sin and, and we have to repent. But the, the more that you grow spiritually and the more that you understand what Christ did for us and what we just celebrated this weekend. And we should, as Christians, be celebrating daily. This is why we have the Lord's Day on Sunday, um, because unlike the the Sabbath in the Old Testament, we as Christians celebrate the finished work of Christ and the Messiah that came um, on Sunday morning. And there's not a requirement to do that, of course, if your church meets Saturday night, totally fine. But what we celebrate on Sunday morning is the finished work of of Christ and and to see how callous the world is and how blasphemous they are in spitting in the face of what Christ's finished work was and to say that God just loves us so much that he doesn't hold us to account for our sin and and repent and turn away from that is completely denying what happened in the garden that night and completely denying the stench of that cup of perdition and completely denying the fact that the love of Christ is not just to love and accept and affirm all of the lifestyle choices that we may have and all of this rhetoric of this, you know, trans day of visibility to say, and I, and I saw so many people, even Christians or so-called Christians that were posting on social media, uh, suggesting that, you know, that somehow, uh, Christ came to, to love and affirm the, chan- the transgender person and that, you know, God wouldn't condemn them. Absolutely. Absolutely Christ condemns sin. And that's the entire point of the gospel that we celebrate. And so don't think of the love of Christ as affirming you in your sin. Think of the love of Christ as loving you more than hating your sin. And we need to love Christ more instead of loving our sin. Because right now, we don't hate our sin enough. We don't have the same absolute agony and repulsion when we are confronted with our own sin. So think of it at whatever it is that so easily besets you. If you had to put that in a cup and you had to smell that foul odor, and I know that's kind of a, a... stark picture this morning. Would you be repulsed by that? Or do you say, well, the love of God covers all? 
What we celebrated yesterday was the finished work of Christ that he loves us more than anything we could ever do. And we have to embrace that and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of him and move forward in our Christian faith and live according to Christ. So we'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis in the morning. And I hope everyone had a very happy Easter. The words you are about to hear are taken from letters sent in by members of the Trinity Debt Management Program. Dear Trinity, today I'm making my final credit card payment. Before I came to you, I was in a constant state of anxiety and panic, but now there is hope for my family's financial future. Working with Trinity made me understand that I'm not alone. You really do help people. Your kindness will never be forgotten. Without Trinity support, I would not have achieved my lifelong goal of becoming debt-free. We saved a lot on interest and penalties, of course, but the reward was the gift of human kindness. Trinity has carried me through a very difficult time in my life. You're amazing. I used to feel so anxious and hopeless. Now I feel grace and peace. God bless Trinity as you continue to help others become debt-free. If credit card debt has you down, call Trinity at 1-800-788-1813. That's 1-800-788-1813. This is Abraham Hamilton III with AFR, and we're sending Bibles. Here's Michael with Bible League International. Abraham, I know our hearts and prayers are with those affected by the Israeli conflict in the Middle East. Here's a great need right now in that part of the world. Nora is a born-again believer. She's a widowed mother of four. Her husband was killed by a terrorist cell, and one day radicals showed up and burned her house down, nearly killing Nora and her four daughters, the youngest of which, four years of age, maimed for life with very serious burns. Now, her crime is, number one, she's a born-again believer. Number two, she was found to be educating her daughters beyond the age of eight. In that system, that is a serious violation. But I can tell you, rather than grow bitter, Nora has introduced about 50 Arabic-speaking women to Christ. They need Bibles in the Middle East. In fact, by the end of April, will you help us bless 4,000 Bibleist believers around the world? Abraham? $5 sends a Bible. $100 sends 20. $500 sends 100. You can give by calling 800-YES-WORD. 800-YES-WORD. Or visit sendbiblesnow.org. That's sendbiblesnow.org. For your walk with Jesus, I'm David Wolin with Haven Today, inviting you to anchor your day in God's Word. I hope you enjoyed your Easter celebration yesterday, worshiping with God's people, sharing a wonderful meal, but now it's Monday. There might even be a mess to clean up. The daily grind has resumed, and it brings us back to reality. And when this happens, it's good to remember what we celebrated. The angels who appeared to the women in Luke 24 announced, He is not here, he has risen. Remember how he told you the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again? It's not only our hope on Easter Sunday, but every day. Why? Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Get daily encouragement from God's Word with Anchor Devotional. Just visit GetAnchor.com. Welcome back to Jenna Ellis in the Morning on American Family Radio. Welcome back. And we're talking about Easter Sunday and how Christians um, should be embracing the finished work of the truth of the gospel of Christ and everything um, that he did for us. And um, and before we, we, we move on into um, some of our political topics this morning, um, I just wanted to um, to finish with this, this verse, but then also um, reiterate that, you know, the point of church accountability and, um, and church discipline and being accountable to a local body. And as Abraham Hamilton III always, and I love how he describes this on, on his uh, show, The Hamilton Corner, to live locally. Um, we should be living locally, be accountable to a local body of a church, be, um, be engaged locally in uh, civics, in our community. Truth in community is the proper definition of politics, um, living locally in our families and the institutions that God has ordained. Um, but this is a wonderful, wonderful promise because God does not leave us in our sin. And so it's not a matter of church discipline in terms of, um, or accountability so that we can just feel guilty all the time. Um, true guilt is repentance for our sin. False guilt is just, um, feeling bad over things that, that we shouldn't. Um, a lot of people, 
you know, I mean, all of you know I have a ton of haters online, and I don't really care because no- nothing that they're saying actually matters in terms of my walk with the Lord and the accountability in, in my life. And so, so the bottom line here is that isn't it so wonderful that God does not leave us in our sin? And there is hope. And no matter what you are facing today, no matter what sin so easily besets you, turn from it. Embrace what happened on that very first Easter morning in truth and know that you can have freedom in Christ. Because if we don't have the hope of the gospel, then we have nothing. Because all of this and everything that we do the entire scope of of the human experience boils down to the question, who do you say that Jesus is? And if he is God, if he is Savior, if he is Messiah, then nothing else really matters. And if he is not, then nothing else really matters. Um, But for your own life, how you answer that question, who do you say that Jesus is, will then dictate for the rest of your life how you live. And this is uh, what Paul admonished to Timothy, who was um, the younger, um, his his, uh, his disciple and, and uh, the, the person that he discipled in the truth of the gospel. And he says, and uh, Paul says, as he's writing to Timothy from prison um, in 2 Timothy 1, he says, for this reason, um, and he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame of the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit of God gave, uh, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but now has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed and herald, a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. This is why I'm suffering as I am. Paul was in prison. Um, yet this is no cause for shame. Because I know whom I have believed in, and I am convinced he is able to guard what I have entrusted him until that day. What you have heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And that's our church. Keep the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So let's walk forward into this new year as we celebrate Easter. And don't just let that be one weekend out of the year. Continue to hold fast the truth of the gospel of Christ and sound teaching. And as we continue as Christians to promote the truth of the gospel of Christ, fulfill the Great Commission, uh, which of course was uh, right before Jesus ascended into heaven, um, gave us that charge. Um, we, we do not expect that from the world, right? We don't expect that the world gets it or is going to live rightly. And by the world, it's not just people who call themselves Christians or Catholics, uh, for example, like our, our current president and vice president. Uh, we, we don't, we know that there are some that use the Lord's name in vain. And, and yesterday, I mean, I, I just, I can't believe how I can, but it, I can't believe how, shameless the White House was in celebrating the Trans Day of Visibility on Easter Sunday. And then Catholic President Joe Biden, this is um, the the New York Post headline, does not want any religious symbolism during an Easter egg art contest at the White House. So this is on purpose, just trying to excise God and Christians more and more and more from civil society. We need to push back, but we need to first be confident and committed to the hope that we have so that we can push back, not out of um, anger, out of maybe righteous anger, but to push back and just say, no, this is, we are still in a nation that believes in religious freedom that is founded on the truth of the word of God. 
and, and reject all of this ridiculous intentional purpose to diminish Christians. And so with that, um, I want to invite in my, my next guest who has been um, waiting very patiently. I appreciate it, Tho Bishop, because, um, because Tho is with the, the Mises Institute and, of course, is um, in economics. And I want to talk about Sam Bankman-Fried and, and, and all of that. But I want to ask you this question first, Tho, because we saw a lot of pushback on social media to the Trans Day of Visibility on Easter Sunday, this religious symbolism during the Easter egg um, art contest at the White House, no religious symbolism and all of this. The social issues matter. But we're also seeing how some would suggest that, that it that it really doesn't matter. And, and yet, you know, they're focused on things like the economy. They're focused on, you know, some of these other things. And so from your perspective, looking at all of the economic influences and, you know, all of these other things that are absolutely terrible about the Biden administration. Um, looking forward into 2024, do you think that the social issues are going to matter more to some of the independents and moderate voters that either side will have to win in order to uh, go to the White House in 2024? Or are things like the economic issues and what we all feel in our pocketbook every day is that going to be more of the emphasis to voters? And good morning. Good morning, Jenna. I very much appreciated your words of wisdom there. Um, well, I, I think it's a difficult question because I think both of them happening at the same time makes it difficult to try to parse the two together. And I think it depends on sort of the, the groups out there. I think that the social issues are a big driving force for while we're seeing um, you know, specific demographics, I think particularly this massive, this, this significant swing to the Republican Party for Hispanic voters um, who are very, very, uh, uh, you know, take great, you know, whose faith matters to them a great deal. Um, I think this is where a lot of the, just the insanity culturally um, from the Democratic Party, the, the dropping of the masks, I mean, the, the you know, the, the, the proudly um, satanic way by which they are treating um, these issues in the U.S., I think that is a major driving force for pushing certain demographics uh, away from their party. Unfortunately, we've also seen at the same time a secularization of large parts of the country. And I think those are areas where the economic conditions are going to matter a great deal. But unfortunately, it also works on the other side where the left has done such a great job utilizing you know, educa higher education, utilizing their cultural landmarks within uh, you know, movies and TV shows, that you know, they have replaced the Christian faith with a set of their own progressive worldviews, where we saw in the 2022 election, where we saw in the midterms, right, where you had people that were driving past you know, $5 gas stations to go out there and vote because they saw that the you know the, the right to, to an abortion was more important than the economic uh, hurdles that they were having, and so I think you know those are uh, so you know depends kind of on, on different parts of the electorate, major major parts of the electorate that you know those that are, are motivated mainly by the economic distress that they are dealing with, large parts of the country rejecting the progressive crusade, and unfortunately parts of the the country where the progressive crusade is successful in getting people to overlook their own economic hurdles. And I think that's kind of, you know, who, who ends up having the, the greatest sway within this election. I think it's largely going to come down to, you know, what, what exactly does that landscape look like uh, when it comes to 2024? Mm, yeah, really well said. And and I think you're absolutely right that I mean, we see this with the this the rise of the secular culture. And this is why it's so important that Christians are engaged in civil society so that we can hopefully uh, combat that element of secularizing culture. Because we tend to, as you know, one of my favorite authors, Nancy Piercy, describes it as kind of the secular sacred divide where some Christians act like only what we do in church is sacred. And then what what we do in our regular life, our work, our um, civil society, that, that is by definition secular. And we need to have a different vision of that. And, and that's why it's so important to see the entire scope of civil government and the, the institutions that God has ordained being under his authority so that Christians can go into civil society and talk about morality, talk about truth, and, um, and hopefully reclaim a lot of 
what the left has intentionally purposed uh, to be transformed into a secular society and hopefully then on the moral issues um, engage more in voting because it, it's so sad to me that that Christians as a voting block, even though it's a big voting block, not every Christian votes. Um, not every uh, everyone who identifies as as a Christian and evangelical, you know, and in that demographic, um, will vote. And that that is um, that is really sad because we could have a bigger influence if we did. But then also um, millennials as well and Gen Zers. I mean, as the largest voting block, there is so much uh, that is is just kind of this. Um, passive apathy that a lot of uh, of young people still have, even though we're seeing, you know, a rise of some who are engaged in some of these social issues. But um, how important is is that aspect as well of of the voting block of the younger demographic that are being raised in these institutions that are turning them away from God? Well, I think it's particularly interesting with Generation Z because we're actually kind of seeing it from from both sides on that. Uh, you know, on on some, um, you know, you have kind of the most radical viewpoints from progressive lens really taking hold. Um, you know, we see this with um, you know much higher rates of identification with you know trans ideology or um, you know other other aspects of you know the the LGBTQ movement there. But we're also seeing a, 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 a I think, a, an upswing within uh, younger generations, you know, younger people in that generation that are take their faith very, very seriously. Perhaps more serious. The, 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 the pockets of Generation Z, you know, take their religion more seriously than say millennials um, might have. So I think that's one of the interesting aspects of Generation Z, and I think part of that is. Uh, a variety of conditions that they've been born into, both in the social media sphere and the way that it constantly absorbs information. You get you have you have a rejection of some of it, uh, some of the stuff that's out there. The ability to uh, consume more content that is not sort of filtered by sort of traditional media platforms and the like. So I, I think Generation Z itself is a very fascinating one. But again, the the the, the left has been very effective. I mean, this is why you know Trans Day of Visibility and things like this matter. Um, you know, they have been very, very smart in the way that they try to – they recognize the role of holding political power in the way that it can shift uh, kind of the cultural landmarks, including on the calendar, right? I mean this is a, something that goes back to, to Rome, right? If you had a, a – you know, the emperor would try to – would create uh, um, you know, these great days of celebration, honoring their, you know, victory of their generals and praising their state, right? The, the consolidating power, utilizing these moments in the calendar. Um, the left has been very effective at both diminishing traditional holidays um, from the public sphere, well, whether it's, you know, sorry, you know, Christmas or Easter or whatever, and then replacing them with secular alternatives um, and the like. And so they have been very effective at utilizing their political power to install um, their cultural agenda in, in, of, in, a, in a variety of their institutions, whereas, again, the, unfortunately, the, the right has been on the retreat on many of these sort of things. Um, you know, I saw this. I, I think this played a role in the, the Juneteenth, um, making that a, a federal holiday, where something was, it was never had no national significance at all. It was always a regional holiday, and a, and a good one with, within the context of, say, Texas and that. But you had Republicans going on board, allowing the left to put in place a new civil rights holiday, which promotes the political agenda, which is going to be taught in the schools and the like. And so there's all these aspects of the left has been so much more effective at utilizing the levers of power when they have it to install these cultural dynamics there that's obviously going to have a major fallout with future generations. And we're, if we do not engage with that, if, if our answer to future generations is, oh, well, you know, golly gosh darn, I, we recognize that you know, you're, you're saturated in debt, you don't have the same prospects, you know, lift yourself up with your bootstraps. If we don't have a message that is compelling to those younger generations, um, you know, then the, the, the future of this country is in a very dire state. So well said. And I'm speaking with Tho Bishop, who's my guest this morning from the Mises Institute. And um, and you're absolutely right. And it's 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 really sad to see conservatives often uh, shrink back from advancing, uh, making advances in culture, because we don't just have an argument. We have the only morally, internally consistent argument for all of these issues and the responses um, to the the left and to a, an over-secularized culture, and we have to continue to promote 
good and restrain evil and and use the majority and the power when we have it. And uh, we're already out of time for this segment. I wanted to ask you about Sam Bankman Free, but maybe we can get to that tomorrow um, if Tho can come back. Because um, you know, speaking of Gen Z, um, that was just a really interesting uh, story as well. But we'll have to get to that one another day. But I think uh, that conversation is actually a lot better than what I had planned. So <laughs> we'll be right back with more here on Jenna Ellis in the morning. University. That wasn't stereo right there, fellas. <laughs> that uh, that's jumbled. Good. We were struggling. The bumblebee was called the humblebee. Is that true? Chicken legs are also called drumsticks. Yeah, 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 that's not a good ice cream flavor. They've got some little tiny saddles that they put on those dragons. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can only ride them once. Because then they turn around and take your yeah. leg off. <laughs> hey, Andrew, you want to ask it? I'm so excited about getting on. I missed my exit. <laughs> oh. Friday mornings at 10 Central on American Family Radio. American Family Association, a ministry with a mission to inform, equip, and activate people like you to strengthen the moral foundations of American culture and to give aid to the church here and abroad in her task of fulfilling the Great Commission. We couldn't do it without your day-to-day -day support. Together, we are making a difference. American Family Association. Find us online at afa.net. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. My name is Abraham Hamilton III, and this is the Hamilton Minute. At the height of a Holy Spirit outpouring in Samaria, where the gospel was being preached with great power and droves of people were converting to follow Christ, the Lord instructed Philip to leave Samaria and head south to Gaza. Philip didn't know a divine appointment awaited him. Through his ministry to the Ethiopian eunuch, the gospel would spread to Africa. He left the crowd to serve one. I call this step-down faith. It's easy to step up for the attention and applause of the masses, but do we have step-down faith? Listen each weekday from 5 to 6 p.m. Central for The Hamilton Corner with Abraham Hamilton III, public policy analyst for the American Family Association. Hey, man, what are you doing? I'm just relaxing. I'm lying here in a shallow stream with my head downstream, letting the water run past me clears my mind. I call it streaming. Okay, uh, you know that word already has another meaning, right? AFA Streaming offers free and subscription video content. Titles like By Design, The God Who Speaks, and Asbury Revival, Desperate for More. You'll also find video versions of AFR programs like The Hamilton Corner, At the Core, and Today's Issues. AFR programs are added every weekday, and other content is produced by American Family Studios with more on the way. You can visit afa.net and click on Streaming, or you can find us on Roku video streaming on the AFA platform. And you don't even have to get wet. <sighs> Welcome back to Jenna Ellis in the Morning on American Family Radio. We remember the suffering and death of God's only Son and His glorious resurrection on the third day. On Easter Sunday, we proclaim with joy, Christ is risen. That was President Trump's Easter message yesterday. Wasn't that such a great contrast to this ridiculous trans day of visibility? I was saying... That's amazing. That's that's the kind of proclamation that I want in the White House. And even though, you know, obviously I have disagreements with, um, you know, with with Trump on other things, that's fine on this. He absolutely got it right. I was very proud of him for saying that. And um, and that contrast is exactly what the 2024 election is going to be about. Do you want do you want someone who is saying we proclaim the glorious truth of the gospel of Christ and the truth of the resurrection? Or do you want somebody who is celebrating a trans day of visibility? Those are your options. And uh, it'll be a day for choosing. 
All right, let's get to um, our next story. We're still following uh, this whole Baltimore um, bridge disaster, which uh, was just was so tragic. And, and the, the video of that, of course, um, completely horrific. And um, last week, um, I think it was on Wednesday, uh, tra- uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg uh, said that even more money would be sent from the federal government to Baltimore. Um, there are The timeline of this has suggested that it's going to take months to do the cleanup, um, potentially suggesting that the government really isn't that prepared. Um, the, the readiness uh, is not there. And so my guest, uh, Ray Alexander, is a retired Navy commander. And um, Ray, I really appreciate you joining. Um, you were on my Salem TV show uh, last week talking about this. And then we talked a little bit offline and you had said there's an angle on this story that implicates uh, Department of Defense readiness and the proposed timeline is embarrassing and highlights our inability to clear ports um, and is is a critical uh, vulnerability. So um, what I think this story, you're right, that there are bigger implications than just this story. So um, so good morning and unpack that for us a little bit. Yeah, good morning. Thanks, Jenna. I appreciate you having me on your show last week and then again today. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to clarify that comment. So if you compare our capacity, our modern current capacity to clear ports and to salvage, uh, do, conduct salvage operations to, uh, let's say, where it was when it was at its peak, which was early World War II, our early our involvement in World War II after uh, Pearl Harbor, um, you know, we're, we're in an embarrassing, embarrassing state of, of kind of uh, in uncap- incapability. Um, right now, we essentially have very, very few organic resources available to clear ports, organic to the, to the DOD, the Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, or the Navy salvage operations. Uh, and we contract out pretty much everything to commercial companies for salvage. Wow. What that creates is a, is a significant risk, um, primarily with coordination and availability of resources. Well, and and so how did we get here? I mean, has this happened just in the last four years of Biden or has this been kind of a, a, a bigger scope of the federal government's problem for a while? Yeah. So generally speaking, we've lost, uh, sense of the importance, the critical nature of um, our mission, uh, the Navy's, the U.S. Navy's mission, which is to maintain freedom of the seas. Uh, very clearly, I think everybody understands that uh, a, a strategic center of gravity for the United States, probably the most important strategic center of gravity, is our economy. And nothing keeps our economy moving uh, more than our ability to transport goods a- across the globe. And we don't, there's no other, there's no more efficient way to do that than through naval shipping. So, you know, that being said, the most, one of the most important critical uh, capabilities that we have is a strong Navy. And we've lost, we've, I think we've lost an appreciation for that uh, in both the federal government, the DOD, and probably most importantly, um, the American public. Mm. And and for the American public, too, I, I think that in the and, you know, certainly this is a, a generalization, but, you know, when we think of the Navy, we, we think of more military capabilities and more of the um, the strategy there in terms of, you know, our, our foreign adversaries and more of the politics in that, not so much um, the economic impact. And so how should um, voters in particular think of um, this type of readiness and the importance of, of the Navy to a strong economy? Well, there's been recent examples of how critical um, open sea lanes are to our economy and to keeping uh, the, the world economy moving efficiently. Um, the two that come to mind are the recent logistics slowdown resulting from the government's response to the COVID emergency, um, where you know, ports were shut down or friction was introduced, most uh, bureaucratic friction primarily was introduced in our, in our U.S. shipping ports, and that caused a massive slowdown of the, our capacity to offload cargo at our shipping ports. You see a very tiny example of that right now with, uh, not tiny, but relatively smaller scale example of that in Baltimore right now where there are ships both waiting in port uh, in, the, in, in the harbor north of the key bridge and then you see them you see many ships building up at anchor out in um, the Chesapeake Bay area and further south and uh, 
another great example is what's happening right now in the Red Sea, where a small band of you know, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to overstate their capability or understate it either. The, the Houthis are being supported by Iran and therefore have some um, seasoned and intelligent leadership, at least advising them. But they are a relatively small group of um, fighters and insurgents, and they are able to essentially shut down one of the most important shipping lanes in the world, and that's the, the Bab el Mandeb at the southern entrance of the Red Sea. So, and you, and you see the effect of this in, in basically skyrocketing prices. When it costs more to ship, it costs more for the consumer to buy. I'm speaking with uh, Ray Alexander, who is a retired um, naval commander, and uh, we thank you so much for your service. And you can follow uh, Ray on X, formerly known as Twitter, at RMA1776, and um, posts a lot of, you know, just really interesting commentary and um, retweets others that, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily see if it weren't for following your account. And so, you know, this is why curating kind of who you follow um, for it, just information and different perspectives is always interesting. And one of the people that um, that you had reposted also talked about how um, our Navy has sold off almost its entire fleet of salvage ships. And um, and, and so this this person, uh, John Conrad, um, that's you know, his name that he goes by on, on X, says we don't even have a single fireboat in the Navy's most important port. And... You know, th this just seems like the current administration, at least, and for however far back you know this has gone, there's just been really not a lot of attention on this. I mean, I know President Trump was very attentive to military readiness, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but but how is this even possible that we're just kind of selling off all this stuff and that the public doesn't seem to either be informed of it or paying attention to it? Yeah, it, it it's being the gap is being filled by by commercial contracts, so contracts with commercial salvage companies. And, and so it's hard to see the difference. For example, right now in Baltimore, you have uh, three, well, you have three different salvage operations going on right now. Um, clearing the, the shipping lane is the responsibility of the federal government, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has contracted two separate companies, one to clear the vessel and two to clear the bridge from the main channel. And then the third contracted effort is going to be through the Maryland Department of Transportation to clear the adjacent bridge uh, that's on the either side of the channel. And so the, the public doesn't really have much of an appreciation for it because the work gets done. Uh, the, the challenge that you'll have, though, is, one, the public doesn't realize how quickly this could be done with a central, under a central authority, say a DOD port clearance authority, um, and how efficiently it could be done. And also how flexible that that asset would be or that resource would be. So to answer your question, the public doesn't have much of an appreciation for it because the work gets done. Uh, it's just they don't really realize how how much more quickly and efficient, effectively the work could get could get done under single leadership or under you know consolidated leadership. And that makes sense, uh, Ray Alexander, because uh, Jesse Kelly, our friend over at um, at the first, had tweeted, you know, in the in the wake of this uh, Baltimore disaster, he said, "Also, I know there's debris in the way, and I know it's heavy. I get why ships aren't moving today." Um, and, and this was, you know, early last week. He said, "But for months, you can't clear a path for the ships for months. Be serious." And um, and I think that that speaks to your point that if this were more efficient then it wouldn't take, you know, this long to um, to clear this port that that does, you know, billions of dollars of of commercial business um, annually. And and I mean, how is just this one port going to potentially affect um, the overall economy um, for the next couple of months until the work gets done? Yeah, we expect a we expect the, the impact to be absorbed relatively uh, seamlessly by the surrounding ports on the east on the eastern seaboard. Um, however, the impact to the economy of Baltimore is going to be massive. It already is massive. They're losing hundreds of millions of dollars a day um, in, in their inability to move cargo, not just via not just via um, the Baltimore Channel or you know, not just out of Baltimore Harbor, but also a route. 695 was a massive, you know, 30,000 a day uh, vehicle uh, highway, and it provided trucks access to those ports. So not only are you shutting down the port itself, but you're also shutting down 695. And so 
vehicle traffic is going to have to route to 95, which is north of, of 695 through the heart of Baltimore. There really are very few other options unless you want to go all the way north around Baltimore. So it's not just a, a maritime problem, but also a, an interstate transportation problem. <laughs> wow. And and that gets us back to where we started with uh, Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who, um, in, in my view, is totally incompetent and, you know, was not qualified for this job anyway. But, you know, with all of the um, the, the knowledge and, and perspective that you have, uh, Ray Alexander, um, you know, is he doing even modestly the right things um, here? Or is there something that the federal government should be doing? I mean, yes, they weren't ready. But now that this has happened, um, is it good to be sending this this much of, of additional federal resources to Baltimore, or what really should be the solutions that conservatives should expect? So what you're seeing, I agree with you. I think Secretary Buttigieg is incompetent and um, uh, has demonstrated that incompetence during his entire tenure. It should be removed from office. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, it's the people that are working under him that are making this uh, somewhat effective operation. Um, The funds that you see being pushed by the federal government to Baltimore are will almost entirely be spent via contracts uh, through marine contracts and salvage contracts, support contracts. There is some small bit of it that's going to Coast Guard operations. Um, I've heard I've read that there is going to be 100 or 1100 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, headed to Baltimore on orders on Title 10 orders. So they are, the federal government is activating what appears to be sufficient resources. The the challenge is less about resources, though, and more about leadership, in my opinion. Um, And what I'm concerned about happening, especially in an election year, is there will be a lot of chest thumping, a lot of people standing at at, uh, dioceses, speaking to the press about their perspective on this problem. And all that's going to interfere with the site operations and the site commander's operations. Uh, It's a kind of an age-old issue with emergency response, where you have an emergency response uh, coordinator, a leader of a unified command like what's happening in Baltimore, and they spend most of their time uh, walking back comments from higher authorities. And that's, I mean, that, that is par for the course for this, for this executive administration. And so I think, I don't think that's going to get any worse. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't think that's going to get any better, uh, particular in election year. I think there's going to be a lot of, um, there's a lot of incentive for politicians to engage in levels at levels that is not appropriate for them. Yeah, uh, and I'm speaking with Ray Alexander, who's a retired uh, Navy commander, and you can follow him on X, formerly known as Twitter, at RMA1776. See a lot of interesting insights. So in just the last uh, two minutes I have with you, Ray, and I so appreciate you joining because, you know, all of these things, I mean, this is way outside of um, of my level of expertise and how you're describing this makes so much sense. So what questions should conservatives be be asking um, as we continue to follow this this Baltimore story and and hopefully um, you know rise to to the level of attention of you know members of Congress and and as we are good constituents um, what should we be looking for and and expect? So I think conservatives should expect uh, our leadership to delegate authority to the appropriate level and to trust but verify that authority via back channels. Um, I'd much rather have, just like I was just talking about with political leadership becoming involved on scene um, or with national media, obviously political leadership has to make statements. However, those statements should be coordinated with on scene command. Conservatives are, are, I think, particularly good at delegating authority to appropriate and, and properly trained professionals and then trusting them to do their work. Uh, there was uh, an issue years ago with a, a, a uh, vehicle shipping vessel uh, called the Golden Ray down at Brunswick, Georgia, where the first thing that happened was uh, the federal government activated an army of environmental engineers, and they spent a year analyzing, just analyzing the wreckage and not actually wow. proceeding with work. It took four years to clear that, that wreckage. That's and they ended up That's making insane. And, and Ray, we, we got to leave it there. I'm so sorry we're at the end of the show, but this is why I always love talking to Ray um, about all of this stuff. We'll have him on again. But thanks so much. And a lot of you have already written in just saying thanks so much for today's first segment in particular. Um, go out and live in the grace and truth of our Lord and Savior. Make it a great day.
The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American family.